during an evangelistic weekend. And so we, we, at least that weekend jumped out of order and now we're picking up where we left off there and uh, tying it together with the past two weeks. So uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 11, 18, I'll be reading the passage in the context of the sermon. So I won't take the time to do it now independently. And so uh, again, before we come before the word, I, I'd love to lead us in a time of brief prayer. And so father, we want to uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and to look at your word. And we pray that as we do so, you would give us a heart to receive. You would open our ears so that, uh, Lord, we uh, hear your word. Help us to understand what it meant to the original audience, therefore what it still means, but how we are to apply it today in our context. Would you do that, Lord, in Jesus' name? Amen. In 1910, according to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, around 82% of the world's Christians were from the global north. And yes, that would in include uh, the greatest portion of Asia. Only 18% or so were from the global south. So again, 1910, 82% from the global north, 18% from the global south. In 1970, so now fast forward 60 years, 41.3% of Christians lived in the global south. So that went from 18% in the global south to 41.3%. Today, approximately 65% of all Christians are from the global south. And so you've had a reverse in terms of majority minority. Now the majority of Christians are in the global south in just 100, 110 years. In regards to evangelicals, because those first stats deal with all Christians, those who self-identify as Christians. And so that's the three major branches of, Pro or of uh, Christianity, Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, and Eastern Orthodoxy. But let's narrow in on what we are as a church, and that is uh, an evangelical church, believing in Christ alone and the Bible as uh, fully authoritative. In regards to evangelicals, in the year 2000, 79.1% of all evangelicals were of color, non-white. And in 2000, that translated into roughly 185 million people. So 79% of all evangelicals did not look like me. In 2015, so now we're just talking five years ago, 84.1% of all evangelicals were of color. And so the large majority of people are not Caucasian. Now, I'm not just bringing that up because of the race, the race relations issues that we're dealing with. But what I'm saying is, what is taking place, according to Operation World, is, quote, an astonishing shift of the center of gravity of Christianity to the non-Western world and to the non-Anglo, non-Caucasian peoples. Christianity, praise God, is now truly a global religion. And so God is doing an absolutely amazing work in our day. The kingdom of God is changing. Now, it's not changing theologically, of course, because the true kingdom cannot change theologically, but it's changing culturally. It's growing and so how does that change, that cultural shift, affect us? In one sense, much of my audience today is reflective of that cultural shift. And certainly the large proportion of the church to which we belong at TCCGP is reflective of that cultural shift. But still I want to ask, how does this affect us today? Well, a few examples. This may mean and probably will mean that we will soon read more theology books that aren't written by Anglo-Saxons. 
already, I have uh, a few resources that I highly recommend. First of all, Ravi Zacharias, any of his books, he's not an Anglo-Saxon, right? And so anything by Ravi Zacharias, um, but uh, my good friend, Matt Kim. Matt Kim is now one of the preaching professors at Gordon-Conwell, uh, and Matt uh, just released a, a book about um, recovering, rediscovering the Asian voice in North American preaching. Matt himself is from South Korea, uh, Dr. Matt Kim, I should say, but Matt. And so he's an example, or that's an example of a book not written by an Anglo-Saxon that we're going to start to be reading, or we should start to be reading. And there are others, and you could tell me about others, and I could tell you about others. This also may mean that some of the hymns or the praise songs that we sing will take on a more global flavor. And they should. Because if you leave it to me, as much as I love global music, my playlist equals basically what we were singing this morning. Songs written by Anglo-Saxons. I think good theology in those particular songs, but there are other ones that are out there. Educate me. Help me know what they are, and let's start to sing them. This may mean that our way of doing missions and evangelism has to change. It may mean that, and it should mean, that our local churches will even change as we find more and more immigrants of many nationalities settling all around us in the greater Philadelphia area. And so how should we perceive this global shift in Christianity? What's going on? And what should our response be as Christians who are a part, I remind you, of the invisible universal church? So what's going on? And what should our response be to what God is doing? Well, those questions and all of these issues are addressed in our text. Again, Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 11, 18, where we will learn, I believe, that God has clearly demonstrated that his kingdom is boundaryless. And since he has done such a marvelous work before us and continues to do this marvelous work before us, it is his work that pushes us out of our ethnic and cultural comfort zones to expand his kingdom. And since it's his work, all glory is due to him alone. So again, God has clearly, clearly demonstrated that his kingdom is boundaryless. And since he has done this marvelous work before us and continues to do this marvelous work before us, then all glory is due to him alone. So as we ponder what God is doing in the world today, and as we take a, a deep look at ourselves in, in the mirror of God's word, what can we learn about God's true kingdom versus our own personal views of his kingdom. The actions of God often disturb and disrupt our plans for his kingdom. And we see this in 1044 to 113. That's what we can learn when we stop and look into the mirror of what God is doing into the mirror of his word and into the mirror of uh, the demonstrable actions throughout history and say, all right, what does God's true kingdom look like versus what we think his kingdom should look like? When we look at what God is doing, we find that God often, very often, disrupts and distracts our own personal views of what his kingdom should look like. And that's a good thing because we would tend to make his kingdom in our own image. So what does his kingdom look like? Let's look at this. The mother church in Jerusalem had received the report from Peter that the Gentiles had received Christ. They took that good news and perceived it as bad news. Just look at verse 1 of chapter 11. The apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. 
referring to the end of chapter 10, verses 44 to 48. That is, they heard that report, 44 to 48, that should have been something wonderful in their ears, seeing that people, whomever they were, were receiving the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ and were being saved. That should have been wonderful to them, but it wasn't. In fact, we're told that even the apostles who had stayed behind, right, the apostles and the brothers, even the apostles, those who walked with Jesus, those who had stayed behind, were still entrenched in their old mindsets. Now, I've said this before, and I'll continue to say it because it's a lesson I continually have to learn. When you come to know Christ as Savior, at whatever age that is, and especially if you come to know him later in life, your adult years, whatever stage that is, you know, when you come to know him, then you have to understand, or we have to understand, that people don't come to Christ as neutral beings in terms of a worldview. They're not worldview-less human beings. That is, they come with a set of presumptions. They come with a set of philosophies. They come with beliefs, whether they're coming out of another religion or whether they're just secular humanists or whatever it is, these beliefs have been taught them since birth by their parents, by their neighbors, by their friends, by their schools, by their societies, by their governments, by their culture, over and over and over, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And that's what people come with. And then Christianity comes in, Christ redeems them, and it's not that the old beliefs go away right away. You have to unlearn, and it's a lifelong process called sanctification, unlearning your old way of thinking and putting on Christ as the Spirit of God works within us. Well, so it was with the apostles and the brothers here. You see, they still pictured God's kingdom through the lens of the Old Testament Jewish theocracy. They saw it as a Jewish kingdom as opposed to a multi-ethnic one into which one entered by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, here we are in the year 2020, the weirdest year I've ever experienced, and we hear that verbiage, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And if you don't know, that is straight out of the Protestant Reformation, it's the solas of the Reformation, the alones of the, of the Reformation. And especially as a, as a church that uh, is Reformed, it just rolls off of our tongue. But this is something that they would have had to have learned. Even though that was always the theology of the Old Testament, the Pharisees had come along, and they were teaching salvation by faith plus works. And so the apostles were raised to believe that until Jesus came and taught them something different, but they still wrestled with it. Therefore, Peter, with his report, became the target of their frustrations in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 11. You see, by the time that he had arrived, news of what he had been doing preceded him, and the believers were not pleased. Let me set the, the context in Jerusalem just to show you what Peter was walking into. And I'm taking this from the Expositor's Bible Commentary. The Hellenistic, that is the Greek-speaking Jewish believers, had stirred up a lot of antagonism by their more liberal attitudes towards the tenets of Jewish popular piety. So these weren't necessarily Jews raised in Jerusalem. In fact, they weren't at all, right? These are a part of what's called the diaspora. And they were now coming back into Jerusalem. And uh, many of them had become believers. And this was 
running up against the culture, the Jewish culture of Israel. Because even though they were ethnically Jewish, they were culturally not from Israel. They were from the Greek-speaking world. And so already they were disrupting things. And this was happening in the Christian um, in Christian circles, and so the eyes of the non-Christian Jews, the bulk of Israel, were already upon this sect. Why aren't you obeying our rules? Well, that was one thing. And the immediate consequence of some of these new beliefs were, say, the martyrdom of Stephen or the expulsion of believers from under the control of the Sanhedrin, which we've looked at over the past month or so. Now, if it were really true that Peter, perhaps the leading member of these apostles, had gone further in disregarding the traditional laws of Judaism in favor of a direct association with a Gentile, Cornelius, well, whatever goodwill still remained toward believers in Jerusalem would quickly be dissipated. And so Peter's return to Jerusalem was hardly to a comfortable situation after a very strenuous journey. Rather, as the commentary puts it, it was more like lighting a match in a highly combustible air. And so given that context, Peter was rebuked by the Christians for participating in this new multi-ethnic kingdom. We read about the circumcision party, and in context, that refers to Jewish Christians who still held to salvation through faith plus circumcision. But I guess just in a base sense, they are to be differentiated from the Hellenistic Jews. These are the Jewish ethnically and culturally Christians versus the Hellenistic that is ethnically Jewish, but culturally Greek or Roman Christians, all right? So the circumcision party, they don't like how things are going, and they want to make sure that they also keep Judaism in place. You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them, they say. You see, it was illegal. It was illegal for a Jew, especially an upstanding Jew, to associate with Gentiles, because the Gentiles were, by definition, not kosher. They were unclean. That is, the meals they ate and the things that they did and came into contact with were contrary to the teaching of the Torah, the Jewish law. And so doubtless, a text like Leviticus chapter 11 came to the minds of the circumcision party. They were seeking to be good Jews, proper followers of God, and they were appalled that one of the apostles of all people, even one of the inner three, if you will, who had very close relations with Jesus, would violate the Levitical code and associate with the Gentiles. As I said, there are things we have to unlearn. I'd say this was probably the hardest thing, certainly one of the top three most difficult aspects of converting from Judaism of the day to Christianity. The fact that now it was okay to associate with these people that you were raised to hate and see as inferior. But they had to. But what was Peter thinking? Did he actually want to invoke the wrath of the other believers? Not to mention the Jewish people at large. Not to mention even further the religious leaders. Let's even go further. The Tetrarchs, the official rulers that were in league with Rome. Did he want to bring that wrath down? We saw how that ended. Jesus died rose again, but we saw how that ended. It did not end well. 
Is that what he wanted? Had he been duped into believing that, that somehow the Gentiles were, were on an equal standing as the Jews in the eyes of God? And this is where I need to, to stop and ask myself, how many times does God thwart or disturb or disrupt our views of what his kingdom should look like? Those Jewish believers back in Jerusalem had their view of what God's kingdom should look like. And God came and disrupted it with what he was doing with the Gentiles and the report that Peter came. How many times does God disrupt our views? How many times, like the Jewish believers receiving Peter's report, how many times do we think we have God's best interests in mind only to find out that we've been fighting against him all along? One need only look at the history of the Protestant church to see this played out. Presbyterians, and I uh, love much of Presbyterianism. Presbyterians have believed that they have it all figured out to the exclusion of, say, independence. Baptists, this is actually what I self-identify as, Baptists have only associated with other Baptists throughout church history to the exclusion of, say, Pentecostals or Methodists. Recently, and this really does break my heart, a group of Reformed Christians, and again, I, I, I am Reformed to the hilt, right? A group of Reformed Christians have attempted to shame and belittle, because that's what we do in our culture today, sadly, They've attempted to shame and belittle another Reformed author, whose name is Amy Bird, because in her latest book, she rightly critiques the teaching that is called patriarchalism. And patriarchalism, among other things, has taught that a man is, quote, king in his home. The Bible never calls him king. But it teaches that he's king in his home, with his wife only being able to exercise authority if the king temporarily delegates it while he is away. But the second he's back on site, all authority belongs to him. Patriarchalism has also taught, now just step outside of the church, just go to society as a whole. It has taught that a female cop should be careful in the manner in which she issues a ticket to a male driver caught speeding because she doesn't want to offend or undermine his maleness. And so Amy Bird is challenging that. She's saying, what teaching is this? But others think that now she's tossing all gender distinctions out the window. They've taken her writings and they've called her online a Jezebel. And they're probably thinking that they're defending God's word and defending God's honor. And the splintering of the body of Christ continues. In fact, it was Amy Bird herself in a podcast last year who said, one of the last places I would send an unbeliever is to your typical Christian Twitter feed. How sad, and yet how true, because we just blast one another. We're doing exactly what society says. Now, I'm not downplaying in any way the importance of examining every aspect of scripture. I'm not downplaying the importance of distinctions, even, say, denominations. I do believe that Protestants have had an ugly history of making the kingdom of God after their own denominational image, though. And I think that we tend to focus on secondary, even tertiary issues of theology, such as the role of women or baptism or the charismatic gifts and the like, important issues, but not essential issues. And we then ignore the primary essential issues, such as the authority of Scripture, the atoning sacrifice of Christ, the Trinity, the visible and personal return of our Lord, etc. And when we do this, we fall into the exact same trap as the Jewish believers did, as we try to limit God and 
we fail to work together with all true believers from all denominations in the evangelical body of Christ. The actions of God often disturb and disrupt our plans for his kingdom. And so when we find God's work thwarting our plans for his kingdom, and as we see him moving, truly moving, how do we respond? What must we come to realize? Well, let me tell you, where God is truly moving, we need to realize that the spirit of God at work is not to be hindered. Do not make the mistake of trying to stop the kingdom. Discern if it's a true movement of the kingdom or not. But once you realize that it lines up with scripture, step aside. Because we don't want to grieve the spirit and get in the way of the kingdom of God. And we see this in chapter 11, verses 4 to 17. Now, in 5 to 17, Peter recounts his previous vision as it happened in Acts chapter 10. And as I mentioned a little earlier, I already went through that vision in a previous sermon And so I won't go through it again, per se. I refer you back to the sermon. But there are a few points about which I want to remind you because I think they drive this particular narrative. Peter's dialogue with God, all right, no longer talking to the Jewish believers, but now go back to the vision. Peter's dialogue with God disrupted Peter's view of God's kingdom. Just as Peter talking to the Jewish believers was used by God to disrupt their view of God's kingdom, well, Peter, his direct conversation with God was used by God to disrupt disrupt Peter's view of God's kingdom. Verses 7 through 10, for example, of chapter 11. And God's command to Peter was troubling. The silence of the seeming riddle of the vision of the sheet that was let down was broken as God's voice commanded, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Put yourself in his shoes just for a moment and try to imagine what was going through his mind. Remember, you have to unlearn a lot of things as you learn to put on Christ. Peter knew, at least conceptually, that he wasn't under law, but under grace. Now he would grow in that knowledge. But he knew that Jesus had taught uh, as much and demonstrated as much. But he still held on to his old Judaic views. In other words, he probably believed at the time of the vision that a Christian was still bound to Jewish laws and that God was best followed through such things as dietary restrictions. And if that was the case, what on earth was God doing commanding Peter to kill and eat? Was God contradicting himself? Was he testing Peter? And so Peter reveals his obedience to the Levitical code in verse 8. Though Peter by no means could be deemed a, a, quote, zealot when it came to the law, nonetheless, there were some things which were basic to all Jews. Most Jews, even nominal Jews today, follow certain dietary restrictions, right? As you well know, the Jew is being true, he or she can't eat something unless it's kosher. Peter only ate kosher things. Now, it's interesting that his response to God is virtually identical to the prophet Ezekiel when God told Ezekiel to eat abominable flesh in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 14. And here's how Ezekiel responded. Ah, Lord God, behold, I've never defiled myself. From my youth up until now, I've never eaten what died of itself or was torn by wild beasts, nor has tainted meat come into my mouth. And so Peter is in good company. He's responding like Ezekiel. But God's declaration to Peter was about more than the Levitical code. You see, God told Peter that he had made the formerly unclean food now clean, which is in accordance with Jesus' teaching, for example, in Mark chapter 7, verse 15, that it's not what goes into the body that makes someone unclean, but it's what comes out of the heart. But though the immediate context of Peter's vision 
is about food. Peter's about to learn that there was a much broader application. God had not just made all food clean, but God made all people clean. And therefore, the message of salvation could not be withheld from anyone for any reason. That's what God was teaching him through the vision of the sheet that was let down. Peter's learning that God's kingdom is not about cultural or dietary cleanliness, but it's about the cleansing that only comes through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so who are we to look at the the true work of God around the world and reject or, or somehow impede it? When people don't sing like us or have the same order of worship, the same liturgy as us, or maybe in the way they practice their faith, they raise their kids differently than us, or they evangelize in a different manner than us, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Theology is not being compromised, but the way that they express their faith is very different. The way that they express themselves in worship is different. It may not make us comfortable, but it's different, not wrong. In those cases, Examine the movement according to the clear teaching of the word of God. And if it lines up and yet makes you uncomfortable, hey, don't get in the way. Now, God taught Peter the lesson and the vision, and now it was time for Peter to go and apply it, right? And God wasn't going to wait for Peter to act. And I love this. Nope. God brought Gentiles to his door immediately after the vision. And I've often had to stop and chuckle, sometimes quite awkwardly, at God's timing. Especially when I find myself in situations where I'm forced to apply what I've just learned through a sermon, a devotion, perhaps even my own study in my office. Again, I think, okay, I've studied it. I'm going to lead this Bible study, lead this class, preach this sermon, and ideally, wouldn't it be nice if this were the way it changed people? Now, I, I, I've i gotten over that way of thinking. I kind of thought that way naively a little earlier in my ministry, but it, it's still a temptation, I, I think, for all of us sometimes. This is how we'd like to see the teaching impact people, and it's going to happen roughly in this time frame. It may take a day or two for the sermon to set in, but then Boy, the next week, they're really going to put it into action. And wouldn't you know, God takes something that I just learned on, say, Wednesday afternoon, and Wednesday late afternoon, all of a sudden, I have to apply it. It's not my timing. It's God's timing. God taught Peter, and instead of waiting for Peter to put it into action, God says, hey, Peter, guess what? I just taught you the Gentiles are now clean. There are a couple Gentiles at your door. I brought them to you. Thought I'd help you along. Peter's time had come, and here is the Spirit of God telling the figurehead of the Jerusalem church that there's no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Imagine what that sounds like, and yet it's not brand new theology, is it? It's not a brand new idea from God. His plan all along was to extend salvation to all peoples, as we read way back in what's called the Abrahamic Covenant, say in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. You see, God never chose the Jewish people to have exclusive rights to salvation. But he chose them as the vehicle through which the chosen seed, the Messiah, would come. The Jews were chosen so that they would be centrifugal outward in their witness. But what happened? They kept the promises to themselves. They became a kingdom of priests to themselves. They became centripetal in their witness and turned inward or at least became stagnant. But that's not what it was supposed to be. Salvation was always supposed to be for all nations, through the coming seed, through the Messiah. And now that Christ had come, any and all divisions were gone. And that's why the Apostle Paul can say in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 28, that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, 
slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so any and all attempts to ignore a particular race or a culture or a social class or a gender, if you want to focus on men only or women only, any attempts to ignore any demographic with the gospel is in clear violation of Paul's teaching and Luke's teaching here in the book of Acts. But rather, as Peter said in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 35, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Several years ago when I was doing youth ministry, I had the privilege of taking uh, a group of teens from my church in, uh, in Malvern to Coatesville, Coatesville, PA, to work with an organization called Good Works, and we would do summer camps. And basically, you would go in for uh, a week, and you would be assigned to a home slash family. This family had gone through the application process. Their home was in disrepair and someone needed to fix it. Well, thankfully, um, because they wanted this done the right way and according to code, they weren't going to trust the youth pastors or the teenagers. So you were also assigned to a professional carpenter who was volunteering his or her time. And so you learned how to fix a home, but they also taught at Good Works that they wanted you, yes, to do a good job and fix the home, please. But if you can't get it all done, our professionals will go back and get the work done. We want you to build redemptive relationships with Christ, if the family will let you. And we were assigned to the home of a woman named Louise and Louise's son and Louise's um, uh, grandchildren. And uh, we got to know Louise. We got to encourage her and her faith. She came from uh, at least a church background. Her son opened up to me, a guy he just met and had told me that he had lost his wife uh, to death the previous year and he was a young man. And so here he is with these kids and we got to encourage them uh, and try to uh, help them get plugged into a church, tell them the importance of that and the fellowship and growing in Christ, et cetera. Now, I have family that lives in parts of Coatesville. Coatesville is not necessarily the safest place, at least downtown Coatesville, and sometimes that's where my family is. There are people of several different colors in Coatesville, but there's a high degree of crime. Notice I didn't tell you what nationality, race, Louise was. I'll tell you now, though it's not important to the story. Um, she was African-American. Her family's African-American. But we didn't see her as African-American. We saw her as Louise in need of help. Just as my brother, who's white, lives there, and he needs some help. I was so proud of our kids because they were colorblind. They just saw somebody in need of help. And this someone who happened to also profess faith in Christ was Louise, their sister in Christ, not Louise, the black woman, who's also our sister in Christ. We weren't trying to identify by a color but one status in Christ, lost or saved. And that's what we are to start to take away when we look at God's boundaryless kingdom. It is boundaryless in terms of ethnic boundaries, in terms of racial boundaries, in terms of geopolitical boundaries. The spirit of God at work in his kingdom is not to be hindered, and we're not to, to, to put it into some little category or box so we can examine it. God will burst right out of those boxes. And so when we take the time to realize what God has done for us and for all people through Christ, there really is only one response, and that comes in verse 18. And it's the saving work of God in Christ should cause us to stop and say, all glory be to you alone. When they heard these things, they fell silent. They glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. At least for the time being, they got it. Now, some of the people who uttered that will end up becoming, as a part of the circumcision party, a thorn in the side of, say, the Apostle Paul, as they will continue to teach uh, 
faith in Jesus plus circumcision, they will become what are called the Judaizers. And that's not a good thing. But at least at that moment, they had a realization. These people are accepted by God. It's not about my color, my background, my ancestry, what nation I come from. God has clearly demonstrated that his kingdom is boundaryless, and since he's done such a marvelous work before us, all glory is due to him alone. And so with that said, I want to leave you with just a few challenges. Continue to think outside of TCC GP and our immediate needs only. Start to think of literally your neighbor. How might you interact with them? Start to build what I call it intentional redemptive relationships, friendships that eventually by God's grace will give way to an opportunity to share the gospel. So look for simple ways to get involved in people's lives. Two, in thinking of God's boundaryless kingdom, learn about the way God's working in another country. Begin to read about it. Operation World, you can just Google that and you'll find the website. It's a great resource for finding out what God's doing in different countries. And then the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at by far the best seminary in the world, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Sorry, I had to get that in there. Uh, but the Center for the Study of Global Christianity, that's what you're looking for. And it has a huge database and you can find out what God's doing in different parts of the world. And then lastly, pray for your unsaved family and friends. We want God's kingdom to grow. He's the one who will convert people, but he will use us to actually share the gospel with them so that the elect may come home. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your mercy. I want to thank you for your grace. And I want to thank you that you have redeemed us and that we are a part of a big global family. And sometimes there are going to be uh, times when we are uncomfortable. I think of uh, missions trips that I used to go on this time of the year. And um, some countries were easy to slide into. Other ones pushed me way outside of my comfort zone. But especially whenever there's any kind of uh, communication issues related to language or sometimes uh, someone is offended because you carry yourself a certain way and that's a no-no in their culture and you don't realize that these things are going to happen even to Christians, Lord. And so it's in those little things that we ask for your grace so that we can um, uh, better love one another as the global body of Christ. And then Lord, as a local church, continue to give us a vision for not just the greater Philadelphia area, though give us a vision for that, not just China, though give us a vision for that, but for wherever you may be sending us and wherever you send us, may we go and not hinder your gospel. 